what the needs are. The equity theory of motivation is something that we engage in so much of the time that we hardly stop to think about it. Now every once in a while when some child comes running up to you saying it's not fair, that kind of tweaks you, you realize that they're judging and comparing themselves to one another or you pass back the test and rather than just looking to see how they did, they look to see how they did in comparison with everyone else around them. Equity theory starts probably when you're 18 months old but it's, it's uh, alive and well among the adult population as well that you compare yourself to one and to, to one and other. In other words, to you want to be able to figure out whether this is good or bad, not just on its own value, but is it more or less than the others are receiving. The handout has a really nice uh, play, has graphic on it that shows kind of the scales that you might want to, to uh, flip back to and look at about equity theory. But basically the four steps, and these happen with a blink. We do it without even stopping to think that we are doing it. Uh, when we're in a situation, so you think about a person uh, and how they, they look at their be, being treated. So many years ago I started into my first year of teaching and I looked around to see how I was being treated and and you know how I used what for my comparison was how the other teachers in the building were being treated in some ways I felt I was was being treated well and in other ways I thought my goodness I'm getting the short end of the stick because I'm working as hard as they are but I'm not receiving as much feedback praise prestige whatever those kinds of things are but the interesting uh, thing that happened to me that I remember at that time is I had a friend who was uh, graduated from high school with me and at the same time I went into teaching she went into business and one evening we were talking and she got on to oh you have it so easy if I could just have three months off like you do you, you know you your job is so much easier than mine because you have these big long vacations and how tough can that be she looked around and in and where I was as I was comparing myself to other teachers she was comparing herself as being as, as a uh, college graduate starting salary so forth same level as I was so the step is to decide who it is you're going to compare yourself to and sometimes it's a group that you're parent comparing to and sometimes it's a person then you look at your circumstances against theirs. Now she was looking at comparing our jobs in terms of summer vacation. I looked at it a different way. I said to her, how many paid vacation days do you get? And she said something like 12 or 15 or something like that. And I said, I get zero. All of those days when you see that I am not teaching, I'm also not getting any salary. My salary is only coming from the days that I'm actually teaching. So you can call it three months of, of summer vacation. I can call it three months of unemployment. And imagine what my salary and my benefits and my so everything would be if I wasn't, didn't have forced unemployment every year. Well, she didn't kind of understand or want to understand what I was getting at with that. But uh, she still would like to have those days off is what she could see that, that I was getting days off and she was not well I was looking at she was getting a salary that I was not we we kind of agreed to disagree and we've gone our own way since then but the the uh, alternatives you have are listed in in your textbook that once you decide how you feel I, I am being treated fairly you go forward I am not being treated fairly you got some choices. I like uh, some of the uh, hand, the handouts, but I think uh, the one that, that I'm going to show you in just a moment probably makes the most sense to me about what you do when you're not feeling treated, you're being treated fairly. This one talks about that really there's four pieces to the fairness. There's what I put in, how much effort, how much time, how much of my life, whatever, how much do I put in, how much does the other person put in to their job or, or their yard or whatever it is you're comparing. The outcomes are what do you get for it, what do they get for it. If there's inequity in either one of those, then people get that feeling of unfairness. 
And this is the one I was talking about. This is the place in your handout I'd circle down there in the, in the bottom uh, left corner where it says motivation to reduce inequity. Equity theory says that you are motivated to do something different when you're feeling that you're being treated in, in an unequal way and that these are your choices. First of all, you can change your inputs. So let's imagine right now that the person who's working next door to you in whatever capacity you're working is coming in at the very last minute, they're leaving at the very first minute, they're putting very little effort into it, you know, the, the work that's going on, and yet they are getting the same or a greater salary that you are. They are not getting any reprimands for not putting in all those extra hours that you're putting in. They're not, there's, no, there's no bad outcome for them for doing a minimal type of job. Well, one thing that you can do is say, why am I working so hard? I am going to start coming in later. I am going to stop doing so much extracurricular activity with students or whatever those things are that, that you, you see that, that is different. I'm going to stop doing those things because I'm not being treated in an equitable manner. You can also change the outcomes. You could go down to the office and say, look, I'm spending all this extra time. I'm doing all these extra things. I need to have whatever, reward, materials, recognition, whatever those things are that you want out of the situation. So you could change, try to change the outcomes. Sometimes those aren't in our hands to do though. So the next layer of what we can do is we can alter our perceptions, how we're seeing it. You could say, you know, to about yourself, number three, you know what, I am doing such a good job for the company, my children, whatever the, the job happens to be, that when I have the satisfaction of knowing that I am making a difference, that my, I am proud of myself for, for, what, for standing up and doing what should be done, no matter what anybody else does, I am proud of myself. So you're, instead of being a comparison that you're overworked, now you're saying, I'm, I value myself. You can alter your perception of the other person. You could, instead of just saying, goodness, they're putting in minimal effort and so forth, maybe I could start to notice, you know what, they have seven children at home, or they have uh, a difficult time, you know, they, they have... Uh, more responsibilities in other areas or they have uh, put in more years of experience than I have and so maybe by the time that I move into that area I won't have to spend so many extra hours to do what it is that I'm doing. It, you start to, to, you can see that this is kind of a rationalization but in a, in a way if you're doing it in an intentional manner it's a change of perception. If it's unintentional you're just trying to reason things away Sometimes you can get yourself um, very upset over petty things or um, not see the things that you can do to change and make a situation better. Another way that you can do number five is to change who you're comparing with. Uh, very often when I was uh, in the administrative in the, in the school building, the uh, classroom teachers would compare themselves to the specials teachers, the art, music, PE library. And the library, art, music, PE, would come and compare themselves as being treated inequitably to the regular classroom teacher. So the regular classroom teacher would say, why is it that they don't have to do conferences and they don't have to do this and they don't have to do that? That's not fair. And then the, the, the specials teachers would come and say, why is it that I don't have a classroom space for me, that I have to travel from room to room, or why is it that my schedule is not as important as, as a classroom teacher's schedule? Or, and, you know, my first comment to either of these groups was, you know, if you really wanted to be a whatever that is, you, you chose the wrong career. Well, that never, never went over very well. But the idea was that, you know, if I'm a music teacher, I should compare myself to music teachers and not compare myself to kindergarten teachers. There's pluses and minuses to every job, but they aren't equal. You know, fair is not equal. Fair is people getting what they need. Fair is not everybody getting the same. That's the most unfair thing that you can do, is give everybody the same. You know, if I gave everybody a size six pair of shoes, 
that's only fair to people that have size six feet. The rest of us are being treated unfairly. We need to be given what we need when we need it to be motivated and not all the same. So sometimes it's you need to change your comparison group. You don't compare to the school next door or the teacher next door. If you're a first year teacher, you need to compare to another first year teacher. If you're uh, a 30 year principal, you don't compare yourself to a first year principal or whatever those things are. You find a different group to compare yourself with. Or you leave the situation and that doesn't mean like I'm just going to quit my job. It might mean that you're going to leave it uh, emotionally, that you're not going to be so wrapped up in it, that you leave it uh, in terms of space, I'm going to move to a different area of the building or you know different um, time schedule, things like that can help you leave the situation without quitting. Although quitting's in there too. By the way, there's a seventh one. The seventh thing that people do when they're treated inequitably is they socialize their children not to join the organization. In other words, if you're being untreated by, unfairly by the government, you would not want your child to grow up to be an elected official. And where I'm seeing this, and I think we need to think about this intentionally, is I've talked to teachers continually that tell me, I told my daughter she's in high school, and I told her, don't you go into teaching, it's a horrible. And I'm like, what if somebody had told you that? Well, I wish they had, and I'm like, oh boy, that's that's it's the time to rethink some things here because that attitude is going to be leaking through into all aspects of your teaching. But we have to think about: Are we socializing our best and brightest to become the educators of the next generation? And we should be. We should not be telling children, you know, that they are too smart to teach, or they they could do other things, or if, if uh, that's their, their uh, calling, if that's their drive, your own, you, need, you not, need not to compare your own situation to what is happening or will happen with them because it's not fair to them. They shouldn't be comparing themselves to you or you to them. But also, it's not uh, necessarily the climate, culture, or situation that they would be faced with uh, four, eight years down the road that is facing you at this time. So when, something to think about is not socializing our children out of being educators because the best thing we can do for the next generation, the best thing I can do as a sixth grade teacher is go out and recruit the best fifth grade teacher I ever saw. And they are sitting in our classrooms today and and only by inspiring those people to take on education will we not only help education itself but all the other careers as well okay enough of my soapbox here stopping to bit pause for a moment if you want to stop at this time this is a time to stop and think about times that you use this theory so who are you a little bit jealous of who do you compare yourself to who do you what neighbors do you compare yourself to? Who in your family? Who in your who at your job place? What group do you belong to that you're compared to that you compare to other groups? And how do you deal with that feeling of inequity? A good place to pause and do a little self-reflection. So what does this mean? Well, it means that you have to have a, have three messages. One is, how do you get rewarded around here? And it has to be then that there are many different kinds of rewards because person A may do it because of the salary. Person B may do it because they get vacation days. Person C may do it because they feel like they're making a difference in society by doing this job. And so you need to reward all of those different things. If you only ever reward people by more salary, think back to your Herzberg. There's, oh, that will only keep people from being dissatisfied. That doesn't make them satisfied. They also base their actions on their perceptions. You may think that you're handing out the best reward there ever was. 
you may think that you know you're going to motivate this group by saying if you do this I we're going to give you all new laptop computers ooh I'd like to have a new laptop computer computer the person sitting in row three that is a technological resistor will now feel more resistance to what's going on instead of less person sitting next to them that that is was it on the market for a new computer anyway may jump at the chance so giving everybody a new computer is only going to motivate some giving everybody a day off is only going to motivate some even yourself intrinsically this is true it's how you perceive what is a reward and what's a punishment that makes something actually have a reward for you some of us are are sensitive to this feeling of ec of equity they they are not happy when they feel like others are getting more or they are also probably a little bit guilty if they feeling like they're getting more than others and again I, I have to stress with when I work with this group of people that fair is not equal they need to stop and think about what is fair for this if I have three children and the middle one grows two inches and needs new new shoes I don't need to buy new shoes for the other two the other two may need uh, a new notebook and the other and a new basketball you know or they don't need anything at this time and later on another one needs something it you know it doesn't matter what you bring in if if we're going to uh, I was in a school once where one department got new desks and new uh, furnishings the other departments were incensed. Why did they get it? What did they do? Well, the, uh, that department had the oldest equipment in the building. And it was just time for them to get the new stuff. And the others had, all of a sudden, their better stuff became the worst. And it was a major conflict within that group because it was like one group was being favored or, over the other. They were looking at it through, through being equity sensitive. There are other people that spend their lives being equity benevolent, and they are they are happy to uh, be in a place where they they are not necessarily getting the big piece of the pie. That they love that feeling of giving, and and that um, that they they don't have to receive. They have they they get their pleasure out of feeling that their efforts. It, uh, turn into the rewards for others, and then there are those that are feel, that actually feel they're entitled. That I'm only comfortable if I have the biggest piece of the pie, and they are very hard to work with. Um, but when you do work with them, my my answer to how to work with someone that's in that place is to show them the benefits of their piece of pie. How some some aspect of their piece is better than the other people have for them. It may not be better for everyone, but it's better for them. And and so that takes some thinking ahead before you're presenting something to someone who is looking for uh, the lion's share all of the time. Okay, we got one more theory. Well, really one and a half. So got it. got my old Dilberts out for you here. Well, Dilbert, the answer is not knowing which one to read, but knowing that you read a variety of them and find the one that sticks or works for this situation you're in. Equity theory works for a lot of things, but if there is no issue of comparison to others, or if it's just within yourself, equity theory doesn't work at all. So let's switch on now to talking a bit about expectancy. Now people get their eyes rolling around on expectancy theory because expectancy theory has all of these terms with it, balance and instrumentalism and all this. I tell people don't worry about the words, understand what it's talking about. There's, there's plain common sense words that talk about the same thing. But basically expectancy theory is are you motivated by something you want? And do you think you can get that something? Are you motivated by something that you want? Like the teacher that's going to get the new computer, does that motivate them? And do they think they can do what it takes to earn the new computer? 
So there, there's uh, these terms, like I said, and, and you can, can run through and really learn them, or you can just kind of go by the seat of your pants uh, way. This is, this is not the, the, the way I, this is the way I learned it, but this was not the way I understood it. This, and I think I gave you this one as well in your handout, this is how I got to understand expectancy theory. Basically, those three, those three questions at the bottom. If I work hard, will I get the job done? If you were to ask me to try out for the uh, St. Louis Cardinals baseball team, I would not do that. You would have the hardest time getting me into practice because I realize no matter how hard I work, no matter even if I work all day long, study video, go to great coaches, do whatever, no matter how hard I work, the St. Louis Cardinals are probably not going to want me. I'm probably not going to get that job no matter how hard I work, so I am not motivated. Secondly, the second piece of that is what rewards will I get if I do the job well? In other words, is there a performance piece to it? And if I do that performance, am I going to get rewarded for that? Now, the reward doesn't have to be salary or a candy bar. The reward can just be satisfaction or a feeling of... of um, accomplishment or power, you know, all those things like McClellan talked about, affiliation, those types of things. And finally, do I want the reward? In other words, what rewards do I value? Do I want that reward? So those three pieces together, if any of them are not there, it blocks someone from being motivated. There are more complex ways of talking about it, and I know you're going to be glad when I blink right past it and tell you that you don't have to get any compl more complex to use this in a, on a daily basis. Well, this, th these commonplace things are, go back to those same three points. If people don't think that they can do it, they won't even try. And I'm not talking, our minds immediately go to that child sitting in row two that you're trying to motivate Think about the person trying to learn a new job, someone who is uh, being asked for a new responsibility within their job. You know, we're going to put a new curriculum in next year, and we're going to have to teach the teachers how to do this curriculum. If they don't think that they can do it, they, they would rather be bad than be dumb. So I'd rather say, no, I won't do it, than I'm afraid I can't do it. Also, they're not motivated if they don't want the reward or they don't think they can get the reward. So that puts a, I don't know, you're like, great, I'm the leader of 20 people. How can I get 20 different rewards that are going to satisfy 20 different people? Well, part of, partially you can use the shotgun approach, use uh, early release time this time, uh, door prizes that time, uh, praise, um, peer pressure, you know, use different different tactic, tactics to motivate. Sooner or later, you should be catching on to some things that, that and if it's really uh, good stuff, remember what uh, uh, Herzberg tells us is that work itself is motivating. Or Theory Y says that too. People like to do a good job at their job. So uh, it's not up to the boss to always provide all of the rewards. Remembering that some of our people, and we're talking adults here, not five-year-olds, some of our people are morally mature, that others are immature. A morally mature person bases and does their comparison back to equity theory. They can compare themselves to universal ethical principles. What is good? What is right? You know, I'm not going to throw trash out my car window because I'm going to get caught. I'm not going to throw trash out the car window because that's bad for the earth, a universal ethical principle. Whereas the morally immature person may also not throw the trash out the car window. But if they're doing it, it's because I, something about I. It will make me look bad. I will have to go pick it up. It, the world centers around the I. When you're dealing with someone who uh, you're trying to coach or motivate, knowing this piece of their makeup really can help you in framing 
your motivational speech to them. And if I have a large group, I'm going to know that I have some of each in there and address both sides of that issue, both the big ethical, this is good for us, right for the world type of thing, and also what's in it for me. Because both of those types of people are in every workplace. I'm going to move fast through these next parts because I think your book does uh, a plenty good enough job of some of the detail of this. The thing I also wanted to highlight though is that expectancy theory when it was uh, tried internationally did not have as good of, of outcome as it did in the United States for actually motivating workers. So when we're looking at seeing how we're going to motivate other people and you can extrapolate and say for yourself as well this takes us back to something that most of us had back in when we were beginning teaching uh, theory methods about reinforcement, about when you praise and, and how you, you uh, get classroom management through uh, offering rewards and punishments, that type of thing. So when we're thinking about trying to motivate people, it comes back again because you have really four choices when you're trying to change behavior. You can go uh, positive reinforcement, which would be giving the praise, giving the prize, giving the whatever, and so that you do something because you're going to get something that makes you happy. Avoidance is that you're not going to get something that uh, is going to make you unhappy. So uh, you, you uh, are not going to get uh, called down. You're not going to get uh, a cut in pay. You're not going to get something. So you, you do it so to, to avoid whatever it is that you uh, fear or dislike. Extinction is where if I'm going to try to, to uh, change someone's behavior by extinction, it's pretty close to ignoring it. In other words, if, if somebody's trying to get my attention by calling my name, then if I don't pay attention when they call my name, but I do pay attention other times, but when they call my name, they, I, don't, I don't respond, then the, pretty soon they figure out that's not a very good way to, to get what they want. So uh, it, it, it's sometimes a difficult thing to motivate by extinction when you're talking about uh, dealing with a faculty or a group of, but, of adults, but I do have to say what gets ignored is just as powerful as what uh, gets praised and what gets recognized. So it is something that is oftentimes um, not given, used enough in trying to change uh, a climate or a culture of a school is thinking intentionally about what things are we not paying attention to, what things are we ignoring. And finally, of course, there's punishment where you do get, you do get the uh, bad effects of whatever it is that you do. So when you have these choices, that helps you in trying to figure out in expectancy theory what's the what's the reward the reward people think that they want can be just not getting the reprimand not getting the uh, the bad stimulus uh, it can also can be not getting praise can also motivate someone which is kind of a strange way of thinking about it but if they're working for praise, then you can use praise in a, in by by not only giving it, but why by withholding it to help in your motivation. What I basically bring this piece to you, though, to think about is how often how often do you uh, give the prize? How often do you have to to give the external motivation to get people to uh, move in the direction you want them to move? And this, to me, is the good news about trying to, to uh, motivate a, a group of people, We're trying to move a large group of people. They all are motivated by something different. They all like different rewards. They all perceive uh, whether they're being treated fairly or not differently. So how do you work with that large group? Well, this comes out of, out of uh, behavior theory as well. And... If you go back to when they were doing animal trials, they, let's say you wanted to train your dog to uh, sit up. Which would get your dog to sit up every time you looked at it more often? If every time you gave the dog, every time the dog sat up, you gave the dog a treat. Every single time, without fail. Dog sits up, you give him a treat. 
Okay? You never give them a treat. Sometimes when they sit up you give them a treat and sometimes you don't. Or every other time you give them a treat on, on a regular basis. Well, you and I would say, of course, that if you gave them a treat every single time, they're more likely to do that. And that's true, but the interesting thing is if, if you do whichever of those four methods you decided, but then one day you decide no more treats. We're going to stop the treats altogether. Which way will the dog sit up the longest for you? Which way will that be? If, they, if you always gave the treat and all of a sudden you stop giving the treat and they were used to getting it every single time, they don't continue to sit up very long for, for nothing. If you never gave them a treat, they probably decide to sat up when they wanted to anyway. There's no, there's no incentive for it, so you don't see a change, but then also any change you do get is pretty gradual. If you do it every other time, then they will try longer sitting up thinking, you know, well, maybe it's not this time, but next time I'm going to get it. But if you go several times, then they pretty soon say, you know what, I'm going to stop sitting up for you because you aren't going to, you aren't going to give me rewards anymore. It's the one that get, gets the just every once in a while, scattered, two in a row, then not, then several times, then not, and then every, you know, that, that gets the, what they call the uh, variable ratio. That's what that piece is. They continue their behavior the longest. So if we want to, to have everybody get praised or rewarded for a certain behavior, um, having, having their reports turned in on time, having their lesson plans this way or their room appearance, you don't reward it every single day. You don't go around and check every single day for it. That's like giving the dog the treat every time it sits up. The first time you don't, they're like, well, where is it? It's no longer a reward. It's just an expectation. That's what I get for sitting up. You give it at various times because that way they never know when it's going to come again. You may not give it for a while, but then you give it. Then you don't give it for a while, and then you give it again. It keeps them going in between because they never know when the next time might be the time that the reward comes. So not only can you give a variety of rewards to try to motivate people, but you also can give it on a various schedule and reward them to get the most 